Hi, thanks for tuning in to this month's Scoop Book Club conversation. If you're joining live, hello. Feel free to say nice things to one another in the chat box and submit us questions as you go. And you're watching, and if you're watching this later, that's lovely too. If I haven't chatted with you yet um, via book club, I'll give you a short spiel. My name's Kiki. I'm the editorial wellness director here at Goop. I wear a lot of hats, as the cliche goes, but my favorite one is definitely being the self-appointed ringleader of this book club group. It's been a lot of fun. Every month, we pick one book to read together. You can always find the latest on goop.com slash goopbookclub, um, and you can join our Facebook group because we have a lot of fun book chatter in there. So this month, um, we've been reading Just Like You by Nick Hornby. And I'm going to try to pretend not to geek out about getting to talk to Nick today. It's very exciting for me. Nick is known for books like High Fidelity, About a Boy, A Long Way Down. Um, he's also known for his screenplays. I'm sure you've seen a lot of them, like An Education, Wild, State of the Union, and so on. I think probably my favorite thing about Nick's writing is the way he captures dialogue, both between two characters and that inner dialogue, that monologue that you have that runs through your head. And this is definitely on display in Just Like You, his latest novel. It's an unconventional love story, but I guess they always are. And this one happens to be between Lucy, who's a 42-year-old woman who works as a teacher, and um, Joseph, who's 22 and who works in the butcher shop where Lucy gets her meat. It's really funny, it's clever, it's entertaining. I'm going to shut up about it in a minute and bring Nick on. Um, just before I do, a last reminder, 
you can send questions to Nick into the chat box on YouTube. It should be in your on your right hand side and our team will send them over to me and we'll get to some before the end of the chat. Uh, also stay on until the end of the chat if you wanna know what we're reading for November and here's some updates about changes to our format. So without further ado, okay, welcome Nick. Hi, how are you? Hi, hi Nick, thanks for being here today. It's a great pleasure. Since we're doing this virtual live, and I'm sure there's going to be some awkward delays in time and tech glitches, I thought we could start by talking about awkward social interactions. Um, yes. I think there are so many great ones in Just Like You. My husband watches a lot of Curbed, and there were so many moments that I thought, wow, this could be a full Curbed episode, starting with the beginning of the book. There's this awesome description of waiting in a queue or, or waiting in a line. And Lucy's talking about that moment where you're, you're in the line and you're, you're close to entering the shop, but you're wondering like, is it appropriate time to go into the shop yet? Have enough people left? Do I stay in line? And then she always ends up having to talk to people she doesn't want to. And I feel like here, especially with coronavirus, this is happening a lot to me because you'll be waiting like outside of a coffee shop and you're not sure if like the appropriate number of people have left for you to enter. Um, so I, where do you, there, there's so many of those nuggets throughout the book, but where do you draw from those and kind of how do you find inspiration in these, what some people would consider mundane or silly, but they show so much about someone's personality and character. Well, um, I'm incredibly nosy. Um, that's, <laughs> that's probably a prerequisite for being a writer. And I usually have headphones on when I'm out, but if I can see that people are talking on a train or on a bus, I will take the headphones off so that I can I can hear. Um, that particular social interaction that you mentioned, the do I go in or out of the shop, that speak, seems to speak volumes about character. Because as we know, there are people who will just shove their way in, get way too close to somebody inside the shop and don't care. And there are people... I'm afraid to say people like me who will, who will spend way too long waiting outside until the person behind me kind of pushes me in. And um, those little indications of character, I think, are incredibly valuable when you're writing a novel. Yes, I'm definitely the person that I get asked many times, are you in line? And I'm like, <laughs> I, I wish I could just have a sign that said like, yes, I'm in line. Yes, yeah, permanently. I'm permanently in line. <laughs> I think one of the other things that kind of goes along with those awkward social interactions is also this idea of social contracts and what people mean when, when they enter something or when they say something. There was another moment I love, I think it was Lucy, who says, you really can't ask a stranger how they are. It's just not done. It's, there's something so personal about it. You should only ask that to a friend. Um, and I, was that something that you kind of wanted to play with in this book, this idea of what, what do we owe someone and what's kind of like appropriate or polite or. Yeah. I mean, I think that, um, that whole thing about when you cross a line into, uh, the personal orbit of the other person. I mean, I think many countries do it differently for a start. Um, my experience of Americans is that they're very friendly straight away, but then you hit a steel trap. And English is probably the other way around. They're kind of icily polite, and it takes you a while to get the, your way in, and, and then once you're in, it's okay. So there are, there are subtle gradations, I think, between countries and cultures, but... Um, knowing what to say at the right time, how far to push it. That was one of the things I had with, with the young and old, I guess, in the book, that uh, the, the younger people tend to be less uh, cautious than, than older people. I think, too, there was something that we talked about in our book club Facebook group. There's the moment where Joseph has brought his new girlfriend, Hannah, I think, to meet Lucy and they're all at the train station. And it's a little awkward because 
Lucy and Joseph were obviously together and having sex regularly. And he's only just told Hannah on the train ride about this. So she's obviously caught off guard. And Joseph is assessing the scene and, and Joseph calls it emotional porn. And I, I, I really felt that because there were so many moments where I was like, this is a little bit like emotional porn. Um, and Melinda in our face room was wondering like that particular scene, did that, did you draw from personal inspiration or how did you go kind of about writing that scene? No, I think that, um, I, I, I don't write from personal inspiration so much. I make sure that the people feel real to me and that the, the steps in narrative are not too big so that everything feels like it might have happened. But once I, once I know my people, and I, I tend to have thought about them for quite a long time before I start to write, once I know those people, then everything seems to spring uh, from the, the, the psychology of the, of the characters. And um, part of the joy of writing is not having anything mapped out. So that particular scene I remember was all written you know, on the hoof, as it were, and Joseph's observation came to me at the same time as it came to him. Do you think about giving your characters secrets? It, it struck me that everyone in this book kind of had a secret or something. And some of them were really funny. Like I love Emma, who was Lucy's friend that she really didn't want to be friends with. And her deepest, darkest secret, secret was that she was had always been faithful for, to her husband and always would be. So. She talked this big game about, you know, all of these guys and how hot they were. Exactly. And she, what she, she did not want to be perceived as someone who would not or could not cheat on her husband. And yeah. she's in the book, relatively speaking, a minor character. But do you, do you think about, because we all have these secrets in our own lives. Is that something that you think about when you're developing a character? It's not so much thinking about secrets, but I definitely think about, um, what is on the inside and what they're prepared to show on the outside. So this presenting of an image of ourselves, um, and that's certainly the case with that Emma character, that she hasn't got a lot going for her. So her, her thick is that she's a, a sexual predator, um, but in fact she's very unhappily monogamous. Yeah, and, and I know we're talking about just like you today, but I, I did love um, your book, that State of the Union that was set in, am I getting the title right? It that was the marriage, and each chapter happened before a couple goes to therapy. So they meet at this pub, and the entire book takes place while they're in this pub in like the minutes before they go into couples therapy. And as someone who's been in couples therapy, that is probably the richest time of your session is when you're in the waiting room and you're watching people come in and out and both people are thinking about like, okay, what am I going to reveal today? And, and, but I, I, I felt, I thought about that book a lot when I was reading just like you, because I think there's so many pieces of it where you're taking on marriage and divorce and you're looking at it from these, these different angles, but really almost on this like micro level, even in terms of like, how someone's body language can convey like so many different things. There was this one point towards the end of the book where Lucy, I think says how absurd it was that she had stayed married for as long as she did when she was so unhappy because of vows that she made a long time ago to a different person. And mm -hmm. I just wonder when you're, since you've tackled marriage and divorce and relationships and break up so many different points in your in your work and film and books, how do you kind of like bring a fresh approach to it? Or what are you still curious about that you're, you're trying to unravel when you're writing? Well, I'm a domestic writer. I mean, I, I don't write about uh, uh, people who are doing extraordinary things in extraordinary places. The, the stuff of my books, uh, what goes on in our daily lives, um, between us, you know, between our spouses, between our kids, between our parents. Um, so uh, I'm always on the lookout for any situation, any material where I can um, shed fresh light on that. But I guess the truth is it's the most important thing in our lives. It's more important to us than our work. 
I don't think it's possible to be really happy in one's work and have an unhappy home life and be happy, if you know what I mean. I think that, that the cornerstone of everything is our emotional lives and, and that's what gives me the, the, the subject of my work. That's all I am interested in, really. So um, it, it, it's, it's, it's always with me. I'm always looking at people, always looking at couples, always thinking about it. And, uh, and it, it's kind of funny quite a lot of the time as well, the, the sort of mess that we get into. Totally, and I think, not to sound cheesy, but it was funny before we, we were making a joke about goop and mindfulness, and I think one of the things that, that Joseph and Lucy are both struggling with in the book is what what is the purpose of a relationship? Is it that you're happy and content in, in the moment, and it's something that grounds you in the here and now, or is it something that you think you're going to be happy and content with in the future? Um, and I do think at least in America, we have this obsession with beginnings and endings, and we really tend to neglect the middle of life, the middle of a, of a relationship, um, and judge things really harshly based on how something started or how something ended. And I was just curious, because that can be such a cliche to say, like, live in the moment, like a relationship is about the present. But was that something you you wanted to explore in this book, or were, like, concerned, or how, how did you... How did you want to approach that and what were you kind of thinking about? Well, yes, I mean, um, Joseph and Lucy are separated by age and race and class and education. And, um, and I wanted to write a book that was hopeful, actually. That was something that I, I set out to do. I wanted to get them over all the hurdles that were in front of them. And... I would say that the most difficult hurdle for them was age um, and, and will remain age even after my, my book is finished. And their way of dealing with that was not to think about it um, that, uh, without giving too much away, but um, their, their current happiness has got to be the decisive factor in any decision making that goes on. And um, and I guess what I came to the conclusion, I think it's probably true that one's current happiness is the thing that has to define how you go forward into the future. Don't try and project. Don't try and think in 10 years I'll be here or, or we'll be here. Um, just try and take each day um, as it comes. And if, if you are happy and you are fulfilled with this person, then you are fulfilled. There is no future fulfillment. <laughs> it's true. It's it's funny that we spend all of, or a lot of us spend all of our time trying to get that, but it's not something that exists or that we can control. I definitely related to Joseph. I think at one point in the book, he says, he's a hard worker, but he says, I've, I've never wanted to make a decision where my life goes one way and not the other. And I think that is such a relatable sentiment. And I, I think maybe it's especially relatable younger, but I think even as I get older, I still feel that way. There's always those, those crossing moments where you're like, oh, I don't want to have to do this because we hold on to this illusion that going one door closes other doors. In, in a sense, it does, but yeah. it opens a lot of them. Um, but it's just that hard sense of you, you're losing a part of like an identity or someone you could have been, or at least that that's perception sometimes. This is my, this is in parenthesis, but it's always struck me as something that's particularly weird about career politicians because, um, you know, I mean, I think it is true that age 20, they can be in a room where someone's smoking dope. And they're thinking, I'd better not do that because I want to be prime minister when I'm 55 and I don't want this stuff to come out. Who thinks like that? And these people are supposed to represent us, but they're really unrepresentative people. The rest of us just kind of blunder into things um, and, and hope that the past doesn't come back to haunt us anytime soon. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. It's like we can't, you, you can't. It's funny trying to make a decision about something that's going to be 30 years in the future. And yes, there are, there are certain moral issues that 
you should make a decision today knowing that 50 years down the line, you're going to look back at that decision. But then there are so many other things that we spend way too much time thinking about that our energy spent any other way would be remarkably better at use. Yes, yeah, 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 completely, yeah. Um, speaking a little bit about politics, since you went there, um, I this book is obviously set in the time of, of Brexit, and I think one thing that was so interesting was just the way characters disagreed in the book. And to me, it was a really great reflection of often how bad I am at disagreeing with people. So at one point, Joseph says his mom, I think he says something like, my mom could make an argument go forever because she could switch sides halfway through. And I catch myself doing that with my husband. Like, I'll be like, oh my gosh, I was just like vehemently arguing for like ABC. And now I'm talking about XYZ and I'm like, what, what, what happened? Um, and there's so many moments like that. There's the moment in the staff room with the teachers where um lucy notices something like we've gone way beyond our understanding of the conversation but we'll just continue going and joseph who was the only person who was really undecided about brexit in the book everyone thought that was so strange and just even when someone said like oh i want to listen and i want to understand within 15 seconds they were like you're wrong you're wrong you're wrong um so i well, where do you yeah, I mean, Brexit was very interesting for us because, um, you know, as you know, it, it polarized the country hugely. Um, but I started to observe that people who were on my team, which was on, on the Remain team, um, that we were lured way out of our comfort zone uh, and, and talking about things that I know uh, we didn't really have any comprehension of. Uh, because it became like an act of faith. It became like two forms of, of, um, of Christianity. Um, it was like Protestant and Catholic and, and, and people were arguing from faith and kind of scratching around for facts to try and back them up. And I, in the end, sort of felt like a plague on both your houses. And I, I sat it out and watched. And, and what I saw was, um, you know, people who were actually never, ever going to agree on this subject and were never going to be persuaded by the other team. So why why spend all that energy doing it and all that anger? And I really wanted to write about the confusion rather than any kind of um, definitive position that anyone was going to take. And I think it was interesting in the book, I think Joseph is the person that notes how why is everyone only asking how are you voting but why are why are you voting because that is such a more emotionally resonant and it takes it it requires a deeper set of exploration than just how are you voting which i thought was interesting yes uh um i think the why the why was where we got into trouble um basically um and of course your election was the same year and that comes up in in the book and so there's these two seismic moments um which made a lot of people uh unhappy um i mean I, I, as it was i i came to look at both at both elections both our referendum and your election as a large number of people being asked the question are you happy and um uh and we were greatly surprised to find out that actually large num numbers of people weren't happy and they wanted to express it in whatever means was being given to them. And I think that's certainly what happened with Brexit. We, we asked the question, um, do you want things to stay the same or do you want them to change? And people whose lives were not great, why would they have voted for things to stay the same? No, yeah, and I think it's also interesting, even the way Joseph talks about the binariness of of the vote, of the check the boxes. It's like all of these complicated emotions are bearing down to these two little boxes, and they're, it, it seems like everyone should be writing an essay. Or um, So I, I, I totally under, I thought that was brought out really well in the novel. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and I mean, it was sort of, why I wrote it was to try and find ways for people to connect that was kind of round the sides rather than 
bang on, head on, because we weren't connecting in that way. Yeah, and I think it's such a, it's a much better way in when you work your way in on the personal level first, rather than working your way in on this like huge macro level. Well, I think if you're ever part of a group that you didn't think that you belonged to and you spend some time in that group, you will be able to find connections with the people in it. Um, you know, and I've been, whether whether it's work or whether it's, I mean, I, 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 I go to football and I, I sit with people who are not like me, but I have found over the years all kinds of connections with them through kids and schools and all sorts. Um, and, and these connections actually can turn out to be quite profound and much more profound than the differences between us. Yeah, I think that was my favorite part of your, your memoir. As someone who grew, grew up playing soccer, our version of football, and my club was actually called Arsenal, and we shared with Arsenal that we were not liked by a lot of people um, <laughs> for different reasons. Um, but I thought your description of these, how a group of people could be so diverse and then still have this way that other groups of people see them, uh, I, I think that was really fascinating. Oh, good. <laughs> Where was your arsenal? Um, we were just based in the Northeast. I grew up in the Northeast and um, in the States. I'm in LA now, but um, yeah, okay. we... It was it was funny, yeah. Yeah. We had a lot of English coaches, so I think that's where the name came from. Okay. Um, so we had some reader questions coming in. Uh, this one's interesting. Do all of your characters come to you with the same ease, or are some more difficult to manifest or create? Um, I don't think anyone comes easy or, or they haven't done for a long time. The first book I ever wrote was about me, literally. It was a memoir. And the second book, which was High Fidelity, was about someone who wasn't a million miles away from being me. And then the moment you start to push into deeper water, then uh, it's all equally hard. Um, what I tend to do is... Um, walk round and round the characters until they feel real to me and once they are real then i go through my mental rolodex of people i've met over the years and think is this character like anyone i've ever met and if i can find someone then i feel relieved i think okay this is not too outlandish um and there was there was one character in a book who didn't come easily to me didn't feel right to me and when i finished the book i thought I don't know any character like this, and I had to get rid of him and start again. Yeah, and I, I don't want to totally derail the conversation because I think this question can also become very reductive and uninteresting, but I don't think it's an unimportant question. I'm curious for you, you you've talked a little bit about, and I think it's really interesting, writing from another person's point of view, and especially since you adapt other people's work in screenwriting, maybe it's something that at this point you're more comfortable for doing. Um, but you know, people love to, when they interview, I ask you about, you wrote a, care, a, a book about a black man and a white woman. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting because on the one hand, there are some people who will say, write what you know. And I hope if you're just writing what you know, you go out and know and, and learn more things because Otherwise, that's going to get old. But do you, is there trepidation or when you're writing about someone who on the outside a reader would say, hey, this character seems very different from Nick, what, how do you like approach that? And obviously, you put a lot of thought and care into any of your characters. Is there anything different that you do or you think about? Well, um, I mean, we're just like you. I gave it to people to read, um, and and you know, I was I was I wanted to make sure that Joseph was in the realms of the real, and and I gave the book to um, to people of colour to read and and listen to what they had to say. Uh, but generally, you know, I I live and work in North London, and I write about my community, and my community uh you know I, I feel very much a part of and i over the years have developed a sense 
of who is a part of that community. And I feel these are the people that I actually want to, to write about. So if I was writing about someone from uh, a community that I'd never been a part of, I'd feel much, much more uncomfortable, I think. And this is a somewhat related reader question that came in. Since you do write so much from your community, from North London specifically, and from observing people, is do you like carry, this is kind of nerdy, but do you carry a notebook when you're out or they want to know, do you wait till you're home and kind of like peace and quiet and take notes? Like, do you keep a journal or anything like that or? Uh, I don't really, and I, I, I wish I did, because what happens is I remember when I'm trying to go to sleep, and uh, and I think the trouble with writing is there's no real difference between your um, working day and the time when you're trying to relax. That stuff's just going on all the time. I mean, if it's a particular um, brilliant piece of conversation, then I might well write it down, something that I've heard. But... Um, they tend not to be much use to me once I've started the book because I need the characters to do the things I want them to do. Another question is, what authors inspired you as a young man? Um, well, as, as a young man, I was um, mostly inspired by television and movies and rock and roll and comic books. Um, I didn't really find the author that uh, sort of changed my life, I guess, until I was in my 30s. And that, and that person was Anne Tyler. Um, I didn't know how I wanted to write. And when I read her for the first time, it seemed to me, not that I could do it as well as her, but it was something that I might reasonably pitch for. Um, I loved the warmth and the changes of tone and, you know, her domesticity, but her ability to make the domestic feel as though it mattered. So she was the first real life-changing influence. I, I, I have always loved her books, and I agree. There's something... It, I think it's a crime that, for some reason, the domestic is seen as less than. I think oftentimes it gets equated with the feminine is seen as less than, but it really is where the dramas of our lives play out. And um, she is someone who makes them feel so significant as, as, as they rightfully are. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think, you know, if you, if you are, if you have parents and siblings and maybe kids, although not necessarily, there is going to be enough drama in that setup to, take you through several books because you know the, the very least that happens to us is that we lose our parents and um uh and we have long and complicated relationships with our siblings and uh, we maybe have trouble relationships with our kids but it's hard either way um there is so much drama in in the setup without including anything that might happen extra on top of that um Another question about what it's like to see your stories on a movie screen, and, and maybe you can just tell for people who aren't familiar, I think you've maybe only adopted one or two of your own works, but if you could speak to a little bit about that process of when your work is being adapted and, and you're, you're not necessarily super attached to the project, although I'm, I'm sure you're involved in many ways, and then when you're adapting another writer's work. Yeah, well, I, I only adapted Fever Pitch, the first book, because it was a memoir, and, and if anyone was going to fictionalise anything, I wanted it to be me. But also, it was right at the beginning of my career. I didn't know I didn't know I was a novelist. I hadn't written a novel. Someone asked me to try and adapt. I wasn't in the business of turning work down at that stage. But once I'd done it, and I think, yeah, before Fever Pitch came out, uh, someone had optioned the movie of High Fidelity. And typically with a, with a movie, my experience is that they've taken five years, um, which is, is a real long time. Uh, and if it takes you two years to write the book and then five years to adapt the, 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 the book into a screenplay, then it's seven years of thinking about the same material. And while I've got ideas in my head. I don't want to be thinking about the old stuff, really. Um, 
in terms of uh, being adapted, I've had pretty good experiences. Um, I've uh, all I can do is trust the people who want to buy it, um, and after that, there is no control. You can't control uh, anything really. You can say maybe who you want one of the actors to be, or or you can say who you want the director to be, but so many things it's such a collaborative process so many things can go wrong that that the, the idea of control is an illusion so i just sort of hope for the best and be friendly to the people who are doing it um adapting someone else's work uh that's been a really great experience for me because i get to be in someone else's head um however different you try and make the books you're always stuck with who you are and I set out thinking, this is going to be not me. But of course, it's always you. It's your concerns, your interests, your opinions. And, uh, and, and I couldn't have written Wild. I couldn't have written that book. But I got a chance to dramatize it um, and think about it. And uh, that's just, that gives me a lease of life, um, imaginatively and inspirationally. Uh, do you ever get starstruck anymore, or did you ever starting out? Uh, no, not really. Um, I think because I, I do so much script writing, then actors are kind of my peers now, or my colleagues. So um, uh, there isn't really... Um, I don't think there's anyone who's going to freak me out. The first time when an education was nominated for Oscars and we were doing this kind of award circuit, there were some weird times then where you find yourself sitting next to people. I remember one small house party where I thought, I just got my dinner and I'm standing there on my own. And I think, oh, well, Meryl and George Clooney seem to be very deep in conversation, so I'm not going to go and sit there. And there's Jennifer Aniston's talking to Dustin Hoffman, and I don't want to interrupt that. So I just sit on the end here and mind my own business. But the person I was sitting next to there was Adam Sandler. Uh, but, it, you know, we just started talking, and it was it was fine. But I, I, I didn't feel super comfortable <laughs> in the environment. Uh, I, I think that um, football stars are a different league. I, I do get starstruck by them because – they know that they're the most famous people in the world. They don't know who you are. They, they probably don't care who most actors are. They are these incredible gods. So the first time I, I, I met Thierry Henry, who's this amazing superstar Arsenal player, once, and I, was, I, I really felt about 11 then. That's a good segue, because Rupert wanted to know what football team you support, and I, I assume it's still Arsenal, but do you... For people who don't know, Nick wrote this. <laughs> don't say. Are you Nick? Nick wrote this amazing memoir that's that's really in some ways about fandom, um, and and untangling it, and and what it means and what its significance is. Do you still have that level of fandom, or where have you kind of like channeled that energy? If not. Well, um, I don't think I still do quite to the same degree, um, partly because I think that um, modern sport doesn't allow for it in quite the same way. It's, it's way more corporate. I think the link between fan and club um, to a certain extent. Um, but um, I have my two youngest sons are completely obsessed. So I find myself in the position of acting out the fandom because I go with them and I and I experience and have to console their anguish about Arsenal. Um, so from the outside, my own diminishing involvement in it is not reflected in how I spend my time. I hear you. Before mm -hmm. I let you go, can you tell us what you're working on next or what you might work on next? Well, um, uh, I've just finished a second series of State of the Union, which you know originally started like, as a, a, a series on AMC Sundance, and I've I've written another series, but it's for an older couple. Um, so it's like the idea has been franchised; it's different people, but it's the ten minutes before therapy again. And I'm 
currently writing, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about it too much because I haven't got the permissions, I'm writing a very big drama series, TV drama series about real life people who are in music and still alive. Wow, okay, you heard it here first. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Um, well, thank you so much for joining us today, Nick. I really, really appreciate it. I'm, I'm such a fan, and it was really lovely to, to chat with you. So thank you. Pleasure. See you again, I hope. Yes, I'd love that. And everyone else can stay on. I'm going to tell you a little bit about our next pick. Um, okay. So I'm going to try to blunder my wit, not blunder my way through this description. I, I love this book so, so much. I consider myself fairly open-minded, but I will say very dumb things often. Like, I don't really read historical fiction, but I love to be influenced by certain people when it comes to my reading picks. So I was recently in Diesel, which is a local bookstore in LA, which I love, love, love. They actually have a GoFundMe for any LA locals who are interested in helping them during the pandemic. And John, one of the owners, I, I was picking up a few books, and John, one of the owners, asked me if I had read this book, which is Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell. Um, sorry if I'm not holding it well to see. And I said, no, I hadn't, but I love Maggie. I read her memoir, I Am, I Am, I Am, which is stunning. Uh, she wrote an essay for us on Goop a few years ago about motherhood that was really affecting. I also have a habit of buying way too many books, so I said, add it to my cart. Um, and I went home and I devoured this book. I think I read it in maybe a day and a half. Uh, on the one hand, it's just flat out a mesmerizing drama. So it's about a marriage, a really passionate and propulsive one, and how the two characters in it grow around and through grief and loss and hope and love and career changes and family changes. Um, it's set in England in the 1580s. It wasn't intended to have two books set in England back to back, but this one is a completely different era, obviously, and uh, a very different location. So it's in Stratford. Um, the protagonist in it is a woman named Agnes, and she is remarkable. I would definitely put her in the unforgettable category. And here's where things get a little trippy. So Agnes's husband is William Shakespeare. In a twist, he's never named directly in the novel, which I think is really interesting. And Maggie talks a little bit about why in an interview I did with her, um, which you can read on her site. And if you've never read Shakespeare, if you don't know a thing about Shakespeare, don't count yourself out because this book really, really, really will surprise you either way. And I ultimately found it to have so many gems of wisdom in terms of how someone can make themselves anew in a time of great change and great uncertainty. So I hope everyone will join us in reading Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell. Um, we are going to update our book club landing page later tonight. So you can go there and get all the information. It's scoop.com slash scoop book club. And the last thing is that for the month of November, we've gotten in feedback that people are interested in having smaller, more intimate discussions. So we're gonna try our first Zoom with just readers in the club. Um, so that's gonna be towards the end of November and you can find all the details um, in our Facebook group and on our site. So just head there to join. Um, we have reading guides and other fun stuff and, and I would love to talk to you all. Thank you all for tuning in today. Um, and everyone, go get a copy of Hamnet from your local bookstore or check out Bookshop. It's so, so good. All right. Bye. Thank you all.